This is a video of me using my homemade Raku kiln. I made a video a few months ago of how I built it and I have been firing it since then and I thought it would be helpful to put a video together of some of the firings that I've done and some of the challenges that I've encountered and some of the adjustments that I've made to work around those challenges to get it set up so that it works well, so that the kiln works well. Um, these are some of the pieces that I have made with it recently. The uh, Raku clay with Raku glaze. And I'm going to show you how I made these pieces. Uh, so the, the video is set up, uh, it's footage from a few different firings and a few of the problems that I've encountered whilst I was really learning how to use it. And my hope is that if you're new to this and you're using a, a kiln that's been made in a similar way, the video might help save you a bit of time, just give you a heads up to some of the pitfalls that you might encounter. I thought it was important to say that I'm not a gas safety expert and if you've got any concerns about your Raku setup, it's a good idea to get it checked out by a gas engineer. I got mine checked out before I started using the propane tank. I, have a, I had a, a gas engineer just check it out to make sure it was safe and to get some advice from them too. Um, I'm not in a position to give anyone advice about uh, about using gas because I'm not qualified in that in that way. So really, the the video is um, me sharing some tips with you about the way I fire things, um, rather than giving you specific advice about um, the safety of uh, raku firing because it is, um, you know, your it's high temperatures, it's gas, there are flames involved, so it is. Um, there are risks involved and um, I just wanted to mention that before I show the video because I wouldn't want anyone to get hurt. Okay. So this is how I had the kiln set up on my first firing. I'm just going to freeze frame the picture here just to explain a little bit. Uh, as you can see I had the kiln positioned on some concrete breeze blocks, they're hollow breeze blocks, and I did that just to protect the grass and to stop it from catching a light because the gas, the grass was quite dry. I had the gas pipe for the burner going through a breeze block too to keep it steady in case it was windy, and I had the burner head resting on a fire brick too. So with this setup, what I found was that I just couldn't get the kiln up to temperature. My plan was to get it up to 1010 degrees centigrade, which is 1850 degrees Fahrenheit. But actually it reached 715 degrees centigrade and then it sort of hung there and then started to drop off slowly. So I realised something wasn't quite right and I decided the best thing to do was to simply switch it off and do a bit of research and find out what adjustments I needed to make in order to get the kiln to reach temperature. And the adjustments that I made are what I'm going to cover in the next section. So I was advised to make three changes to the setup to help the kiln get up to temperature. The first one was um, that instead of having the burner going into the kiln at a 90 degree angle, so it's going dead on into the kiln. Instead have it angled at about 45 degrees and that helps because rather than the flame hitting right the centre of the kiln what happens is it sort of scoops around the interior surface and I was also advised to have the burner slightly further away from the burner port so that it would draw in a bit more oxygen. So keep it about maybe a couple of inches away. You can move it um, closer and further away from the, the opening but ideally keep it a little bit further away. The other adjustment that I made was to cover up the exhaust flue on the lid. Um, as you can see I've used a spare piece of ceramic fibre to partially cover up the flue. The idea there is to just retain some of the heat and I use ceramic fibre just because it's light and flexible and easily movable. Um, so you can contain some of the heat in the kiln but of course you've got to be careful because the more you close off the flue the more you're likely to create a reduction atmosphere in the kiln so you've got to get the balance right but it's handy just to have something draped over the top so that you can open and close the flue and tweak the temperature as you're going along. 
So with these adjustments I did find that it made a difference and the temperature of the kiln did increase. However, uh, it was a bit of a struggle and it took quite a long time and I found that I was continually adjusting the flow of fuel on the burner head and moving the piece of ceramic fibre about on the flue, just trying to get it to, to boost the temperature. You can see that the kiln is orange hot and I did manage to get the kiln up to 1000 degrees centigrade but it was a struggle and it took quite a long time, it took over an hour and uh, once it had reached a thousand degrees it was wavering and kind of dipping and I couldn't get it up to a thousand and ten degrees centigrade which was the target temperature so I decided that I would just turn the kiln off and take the pottery out and have a look at the glaze and see how it had done so I turn it off at the burner head first and then I turn it off on the tank. You can't see me, uh, you can't see the tank in the picture but that's me turning it off at the tank as well just to be on the safe side. So some of the details in the video might seem a bit humdrum and not that exciting but I thought it was worth showing because it's, um, it's a good idea to just think through your the process before you do it. Like for example something I hadn't thought about is where I was going to put the lid of the kiln um, before <laughs> once I'd taken it off. I put it directly on the grass and of course it burned a hole in the grass. Fortunately I don't really care too much about the lawn but if you do then it's worth bearing that in mind. So the question is, what does this glaze look like? I left it for about an hour, I think, and then uncovered it, and here it is. Hmm, it's not very exciting. It's, it's a bit underwhelming, it's underfired, and a bit dull, quite frankly. But I was expecting that because the kiln had struggled, it hadn't quite reached temperature, and look, the, the unglazed patch hasn't got that nice black carbonized effect on it either. So, you live and learn, and here are the adjustments that I made on my third firing. So this is what I did with the third setup. I'll freeze frame it again so you can have a look. I'd noticed when I was taking the kiln apart on the second occasion that the concrete blocks beneath the kiln were really quite hot. So I thought the best thing to do was to actually put a sheet of the ceramic fibre between the kiln and the concrete blocks just to stop any heat loss out of the bottom of the kiln. I had found that wind had been an issue as well with the other firings. The and when, I, when a gust of wind came along it would blow the flame and the temperature in the kiln would drop. So what I did was I built up two stacks of breeze blocks on either side of the burner to protect the flame and I put some ceramic fibre between the kiln and the breeze blocks at the back there just to prevent any drafts from coming in and disrupting the flame as well. I know that some people when they're making their kiln they actually weld some little metal barn door type things onto the uh, the burner port on the kiln to protect the flame from gusts of wind. I hadn't done that but I think probably if I built another kiln I'd, I would do that in the future. The other thing that I did, which is worth mentioning, is that when I built the kiln, I put one layer of ceramic fibre on the inside of the kiln. And actually what I did before the third firing is I put an extra layer of ceramic fibre in the base, not around the sides. I just cut out a circle of ceramic fibre and I put it in the base just to double line the base to stop the heat loss out of the bottom of the kiln. And I thought it might be helpful just to show you how I set the uh, the kiln furniture up in the kiln. The first thing I do, I do is I put a circular um, kiln shelf on the floor of the kiln. Well, I found that when I tried to put the kiln posts directly onto the ceramic fibre, it was just too wobbly and unsteady. So if I put a kiln shelf onto the fibre, it just means that the, the posts will stand um, a lot more securely. Then when they're in the right position, I put another kiln shelf on top of those. And then this is the piece that I'm firing on this occasion. So 
So the lid goes on and we're ready to go. When I'm lighting the burner what I do is I just turn the the fuel on a little and then light it with a match and then I position it at the kiln. I have read, although I haven't done this myself, I, had re I have read accounts from people where they put the burner actually at the opening of the kiln and then turn the gas on and then light it. Um, what I've heard can happen is that the kiln can fill up with gas in quite a short period of time because it comes out relatively quickly and then when you light it it can cause a bit of a, well it can be dangerous, I don't know whether it causes an explosion or not but it can be quite dangerous. So that's what I do, I just light it and then I put it in place rather than putting it at the kiln opening and then and then turning it on. So I found with this setup, with the adjustments that I'd made, that the kiln was working much more efficiently and the temperature of the kiln started to climb quite quickly. It reached 1010 degrees centigrade, I would say within 25 minutes, so it was up to 1850 degrees Fahrenheit pretty quickly. Once it had reached that temperature, my intention was to hold it there for 5 minutes before I took the, took the pottery out of the kiln. So what I did to hold it at that temperature so it didn't just keep climbing, was I just adjusted the size of the flame, I kept sort of making very minor adjustments to the size of the flame and keeping my eye on the on the temperature gauge. And after five minutes then I turned the kiln off um, as I did before in the other firing and took the pottery out and I'll show you that now. I decided on this occasion that I'd put it down on a bed of sawdust and there's some um, straw in the bucket too. And then just to keep the smoke in the bucket I put some sand around the edge of the bucket too. And this is what it looked like when it came out. I left it in there for again for an hour just to cool down and I uncovered it and I was really pleased with the way it looked. It looked lovely, lovely looking glaze. I thought it was quite an interesting effect from the sawdust too on the underside. So it all was looking good. Until, uh oh, what's that? A crack. So sadly, although this glaze looked really lovely, the piece had actually cracked, if you can just see it right across the base there, which was really disappointing. But anyway, a bit like the pottery, I just had to dust myself off and have a think about why the crack had happened and try again, which is what I do in the next section. And you'll be pleased to know that I managed to iron out the problems in the final section and make some quite nice pots. So let's have a look at those. It occurred to me that there was two reasons why the last piece might have cracked. One of them was that the plate was a large flat piece of pottery which is more prone to cracking especially with very sudden changes in temperature. So on this occasion I decided to fire three pot shapes instead to see whether that made a difference. The other thought that I had is that in the previous firing the temperature had increased very rapidly. At around 573 degrees centigrade the clay goes through the quartz inversion because I'd raced through that window, I thought the clay maybe hadn't coped and cracked during that period. So I decided with the next firing that I would increase the temperature rate at a more leisurely pace until I'd reached 600 degrees centigrade. And also, uh, you can see that I decided I was going to experiment with some of the different reduction chambers as well. I was using sawdust and straw with one of them. And one of them I was going to put directly on a piece of ceramic fiber and put some paper in a bucket on it. And then the third one was just to put the pottery directly into the metal container with some paper in it. Just to experiment and see what effect it had on the, on the glaze. So the temperature is climbing quite slowly. But it is climbing. 
Oh, and this is the piece of fibre that I put on the garden. You know, I mentioned earlier on that I managed to burn a hole in the garden on the lawn. So that is um, what I do now, is I just put a piece of ceramic fibre down and then put the lid directly on that. So it's reached 600 degrees centigrade and I decided that I was going to just ramp up the temperature increase a bit more quickly now so I increased the fuel you can probably see a bit of heat haze coming out of the top there and I jotted down a few notes about how long it had taken to reach certain temperatures there's the propane canister um, you probably notice actually that the propane canister gets quite cold particularly at the base and I have heard of propane canisters actually freezing up completely when they're being used it hasn't happened to me but apparently it can happen So once it reaches 1010 degrees centigrade, I just sit by the burner and adjust the flame like I did on the other firing. Adjust the flame, very small amounts, just to hold it at that temperature for five minutes, which is what this particular glaze requires. I'm just speeding this section up so that you don't have to watch five minutes of me adjusting the, the size of the flame. So when it's getting to about that time, I put the respirator mask on because it does get really quite smoky. And turn the flame off. Turn the gas off. So that's the paper in the galvanised steel bin. And that's paper in an inverted can on the fibre sheet. And this is sawdust with straw. So I leave them for one hour, just let them cool down properly and then have a look. The glaze on this pot is a copper metallic glaze, it's a raku glaze. And as you can see it's fired, fired pretty nicely. So this second pot was just in some paper in the steel bin and the glaze, again it's a Raku glaze, it's called Peacock Matte and it's quite nice, I quite like it. Um, I do know that this particular glaze can be really quite iridescent so I think probably with both of these I didn't put enough paper into the, into the containers, I don't think it got smoky enough. So although they're quite nice they're not quite as iridescent and multicoloured as I wanted them to be. So for that reason I decided I'd give it another crack with another piece of pottery that I had handy. Um, I painted it with the same peacock matte glaze and had another go. The firing setup was exactly the same as on the previous occasion so I'm not going to show you the whole whole process again but this is this is the uh, the other peacock matte piece coming out and also actually with this firing with the general commotion of it I forgot to film it going underneath the 
the steel bucket but with this one I put it under a bucket with some straw because I liked the effect of the straw on the previous firing so um, it was just a bit of straw with some sand around it just to enhance the reduction atmosphere and I left it under there for an hour and this is what it looked like when it came out and I think it looks really lovely this glaze looks really lovely um, and I think it's just because I used more there was more combustible material in there so that's worth remembering for the future and here is a lineup of the final pieces I really hope you found this video helpful and that if you're new that it's given you a bit of a heads up on some of the pitfalls and it's helped save you a little bit of time if you did find it helpful please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel it really helps thanks so much for watching bye for now